had to make a list of the most creative artists in the field of documentary film, right near the top I would put Ruby Wax. Her popularity as one of the world's funniest women tends to obscure her stature as a director, but this time I was determined to get at the truth. Ruby, I want to start with a stunning compliment that is going to overwhelm you because it overwhelmed me because somebody said it to me first. It was Ken Russell. Where is he uh, now? Well, he's looking for a wife. He well, he's looking for another wife, and he's probably mortgaging his house again to to make some other crazy movie. But he actually said to me once he'd seen a couple of my postcard po um, programs on the air, and he said, you know, he said you're lucky. You should keep doing that. You're actually making movies, and they're not costing you your life. And I was just so complimented because I thought my little documentaries were movies. Uh, you might have been wrong about the second part because they were hard to do, but they, they weren't certainly costing him my life the way his had cost him his life. I mean, he had really ruined himself to make his, his, his film. But I think exactly the same about you, that your documentary strand, those, those, those uh, programs you do, are works of art. I thought the one you did in, in Russia, for example, was a, a stunning, stunning work of art. Only television could do them. And what do you think of them? And how can you do more? And where are they now? How, when, where, how can I dial up your documentary output? You call the BBC and pay them a tremendous amount of money, and out of the old catacombs will come Alan Yentob covered in cobwebs <laughs> and handed to you for a small fortune. I can't get to them. You can't get to your own stuff? No. I mean, I have my tapes, but, you know, I, I don't own them, as you know. Well, same here. Yeah. yeah I, I, and I, are we bitter? Well, uh, we, we try not to be. I, I spent 20 years making uh, postcard programs all over the world, and I, can't get, I couldn't get them on the air. Somebody has to decide to put them on the air. Right. And, yes, you get a little bit bitter, but on the other hand, it was the networks that gave you the chance to make them. Sure. But it and was one thing money, led to so another, they... so, you know, we're still here today. And there is the consideration, I think, what about intellectual property rights? You know, Clive James in Rio, well, it ought to be mine to say what... I want to do with it. But in fact, it wasn't just Clive James in Rio. It was the cameraman in Rio. It was the director in Rio. Sure. The producer. They all have rights. So it wasn't just me. But I, on the other hand, I can't help feeling that this, this thing that we put so much effort into should be available. And it's, is it going to be? Is there ever going to be a, a channel? Well, if the board? BBC internet system is as, is as sharp-witted as BBC Worldwide, you'll never see it. <laughs> ever. Again, as long as you live. Because they're so uh, slow off the button, you know, to know what, what uh, you know, jewels they ever have. That, uh, no, I don't think you'll ever see it. So what's the answer? To go back and have our lives again? Well, you know, it, when I was doing, uh, I, I did one of my shows for this series in Barcelona with these five million dollar, five million pound a year football players and how they own their own images and, you know, the the advertising recoups and the marketing and then you meet somebody the guy who won the world cup back in the 60s and he's selling insurance we're the wrong time you know now's the time where you would have owned your property yeah. it's it's over now i mean it's it, it's not over now it's beginning now it wasn't then whoever knew i mean we were all kind of like trained animals in some circus and uh, you were grateful for it well i felt terrifically privileged to be doing it all and uh, is also the consideration and this is why i would never knock the networks is that they made me well known and made me well off to the extent that I can now contemplate doing something else. And they paid you up front and so you could buy a house. And so yeah. On. But in retrospect... Mama got new shoes. In retrospect, we realized that everything that happened to us had already happened in Hollywood and on the same principle. You know, give the, give the players everything they want in order to keep them working for you. Yeah. And that's roughly, roughly what happened. But, but whatever you do, you don't let them own their work. Now, for the next generation coming up, it will be as natural to own your own work as it is natural to breathe. And here's, well, here's, you know, there's always like a tick, there's always a bill. The problem with owning your own work is that, you know, it, just to play the devil's advocate, I did, we did have such like, uh, sophistication and how these things were shot they'll never be that again do you know so you'll own your show on the sofa and you'll own whatever but it'll never be the majesty of how great those shows were because that was like a team working for one common entity and the entity was well funded and now because of um, television being on tap and uh, something like you know you just have an audition for a pop group and people uh, seem to appreciate you know you can retrain um, the masses s think that that's as high quality as something where somebody goes to Rio and points out you know the jewels of society if they think that's equivalent why pay for the 
Why pay for that again? And it's it's very hard, I think, for the audience to estimate what went into those shows. They were they were beautifully beautifully done. But on the other hand, you can do so much more now with the equipment that maybe you can reproduce that some of that quality. But the the truth was that the expenditure was so enormous because there were so many people working on it. Uh, yeah, in, for more people doctor. than should have. <laughs> you know, when you show up with 20 people, you say, get out of here, just give me the camera and the edit suite, which well, is always my thing. Well, I thought that was the drawback. Is if you show up with 12 people, you were detracting from the spontaneity. Exactly. Available. That's why you always had just the cameraman and the sound guy, and then people got used to it in their homes. You were better at that, if you don't mind another compliment, you were better I'll at that than anybody. I'll take give them to me. As so how did you do it? So did you just leave them in the van? You stay outside, all you guys. You well, no, I, we were the first people, probably, that didn't have, you know, when the BBC crew would come in, there'd have to be the lighting, and then you'd sit on the thing, and I was, you know, I remember saying, I don't do naughties. I said, and I, and I sort of came upon the it naughty, by accident. The naughty, you've got to say, better say what the naughty is. The There's a whole is, generation that has never, yeah, does not know. know what a naughty all is. Right, you're What's right. a naughty, right? You know, where there's two cameras, and then they cut to you, and then they cut to me, and so Sometimes I have to react to you. And, and go, I react to you. How amusing you were. And they cut that in afterwards, and it's crap, and it's not spontaneous. And but I you're doing it later in the day, right? Yeah. I once did some, some noddies to a woman I was talking to in Las Vegas, and I did the noddies the following year. <laughs> I had to go back to her. This is a true, true story. I had to go back to her living room, which she had repapered in the interim. So this very strange interview is the decor keeps changing as you... Oh, that's you good. Go yeah. But just as long as you're smiling, they know you're there. But, yeah, but you, you didn't do the noddies even then. You tried to I refused to do the noddies, and I said, <laughs> move the cameras, you know, and ha let the cameraman have the emotion of the third person listening, which, of course, we know uh, eventually went into the big breakfast show where they misunderstood what I meant, and the camera's humping, humping the uh, guest. But I always <laughs> said, you know, I mean, that's where it started. As a matter of fact, in the early days, I did it, too. When I did Imelda, I wanted the camera to be kind of as interested as I was and of course people were vomiting when they were watching it because we've showed it in a big cinema and those close-ups were too much so I was wrong this is Imelda Marcos right and you it was you and Imelda and people still wonder how you got Imelda to do that stuff because if you had had 12, 12 crew with you you wouldn't have got her to do that stuff would no you? But, you know, every, every one of our journeys has another story, and you always wish that the public saw what the real story was. Well, I mean, in that particular case, I, I flew through a storm. Luckily, nobody mentioned that there was a hurricane, so, okay. On the whole, you don't do hurricanes. Or airplanes. But I did both. So, um, so I flew to uh, the Philippines, and they said, Amelda will see you for five minutes. Well, of course, the background is I knew that Amelda wasn't going to just take a normal journalist into her home and love her and take her to her heart. So I went to Theo Fennell, a jeweler on Fulham Road, a major jeweler, and said, coat me in everything you've got. So I showed up at her house in about 250,000 pounds worth of jewelry so that she'd fall to her knees. <laughs> so um, I didn't come as a normal journalist. Also, Amelda has a proclivity t toward women. So when I saw her sidekick, I always called her Shadow because she reminded me of that character in West. Oh, Amelda going to like you. I just went into a beauty shop and said, give me the works, right? So I knew the way to Amelda's heart was sexually. So, um, sorry, I'm talking to my audience. Yeah, no, do it. Yeah, go ahead. Do it. Anyway, Amelda, not, that, not that I, you know, but I know that there's, there's an ambiguity with Amelda. So, P.S., by the time you saw it, there was so much flirting going on that, uh, you know, it was almost, you're watching foreplay on screen. Right. I mean, that was the agenda. So, the five minutes turned into one day, and then Amelda was all giggly with my jewelry and said, oh, would I, would she like, would I like her to sing for me? I said, would I like you to sing for me? So, then we picked out which outfit she wear. We go into her wardrobe, which has maybe a thousand of exactly the same pointy, you know, if, if Satan had a dress. That's what we'd be wearing. And we picked out it, and then she got the piano player. And then I had about seven hours of Imelda singing some hit singles from Feelings, which was a masterpiece. <laughs> to um, I think the moment when uh, Imelda burst into song, I thought, this is, this is something, documentary is a bad word in America, and it's always used to call the special. We said, this is something only a special can do. Only, anything that's not a movie can do is do something yeah. that no movie could ever No achieve. movie could imagine. Yeah. So anyway, then the next day she happened to be um, becoming uh, a member of parliament. So I now became kind of close to her. Now by then she, I had to get her dressed for parliament. And coincidentally, and I don't know if this happens to you, when, we're, when I'm filming, strange things happen to me. Strange things happen. In the garbage can, and I'm not making this up, uh, in the home where she really rarely visits was a copy of Hello from three years earlier and there was, I was on the cover. I've only been on Hello once and that was it because I needed a new boiler. And there it was. 
Now, to this day, I can't figure out, did somebody plant it? Because she looked surprised when I pulled it out and said, Imelda, this is me. She said, you are, I told you this. Remember, I told you this when we were at Dominic Dunn. You uncover her law. She said, she's a movie star. She uncover her law. From that moment on, Bam Bam, her son, was eliminated. The daughter was eliminated. And she dragged me right to the front to meet the prime minister of the Philippines. I was her best friend. She spoon-fed me chocolate cake. And then at the end, I entered the kingdom of shoes, where she said, come, come come to the attic didn't realize that was the whole plot of my film you want to see my shoes ever get those moments where you go bingo but square it well I think one of the great things about you as a maker of documentary special uh, spontaneous films is that you do actually catch these moments you generate them and you get them and I, I, I can only remember the, th the, the things I missed I tell you I was, one night I was filming in Chicago your city my city how did you know you clipped the windy city and it was late at night. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. I was beside the lake. We were filming there. We were filming a man lonely beside the lake. How interesting is that? At one moment, we'd, uh, the camera was switched off. And at that very moment, two 18-year-old, blonde, beautiful roller skaters came out of the darkness, went past our non-operating camera, and away into the night. And I couldn't believe it. And I turned to my producer, a female, and said, We must have those girls skating through. And she said, oh, Clive, you're incorrigible. And I took it. Instead of drowning my producer in the lake, going and getting the girls and making them do it again, I thought, no, I really shouldn't have the beautiful 18-year-old girls skating through. See, that was my error. I was never bold enough. I got some good spontaneous stuff, but I miss moments like that. And what I love about your programs is that you caught them. Like your Russia program, which I find fascinating. That girl in the Russia program... She has been in Russian movies about Russia ever since. If you go and see this thing about Stalingrad, Rachel Weisz is playing that character, the tough Russian. Where did you find her? Oh, again, the story is more interesting than in the film. It, it, it's a long story. Give me the short version. The short version. <laughs> did they wish you on her? Did they wish her on you? Was she the? the she was the official girl. Or if you only knew, she was. Her father was a famous filmmaker. He did Brothers Karamazov, but they put his Oscar in a safe, and they actually didn't find it until about a year or a month before I filmed. You know, Glasnost was just on the cusp, so people were quite fearful. Well, Russia was still the Soviet Union. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how she, you got in there. She wasn't. Why did they let you in, of all people? Maybe that we, was. We paid off somebody. All right. Oh, I could name names because they. Uh, um, she was an interpreter, um, but uh, I don't know how to say that. It's too complicated. Somebody, it was a scam. I mean, it was a scam. They, they said, when you go into Russia, everybody else who had done documentaries was allowed the same prostitute, the same teacher, and the same fireman. So when we went in, <laughs> the head of um, the minister, minister of Arts was her professor, and she spoke and said, let him in. So it was, she was taking quite a little risk there. And they were watching us. I mean, no question, our faxes were being bugged. You know, our sound was always really eerie because we were being bugged and everybody was frightened because they thought if they spoke out and then things went wrong, that they would be imprisoned. I mean, they were terrified. Um, we, got, we got a lot of people out. That was the deal. Right. That if they were in our film, we would help them out. And so you said you, your she timing, also got out. Your time was, timing was miraculously good. Yeah. You were five minutes before the Five minutes. The well, uh, the other thing is her boyfriend was the second most famous poet in Russia, so he could never send her money. They had a kid together. Andre, I forgot his name, but, you know, it's a, I'm sure you know it. So she did have Yves Saint Laurent and Calvin Klein. Those were the outfits, and Mark Chapman didn't tell me that. So when I'm with her, I thought I'm going to get some poor schlep. First of all, she's more beautiful than I could ever dream. And she's that one you of don't the most need, beautiful women I've ever seen. You don't need that upstaging you as your, you know, kind of like smaller roles. It was like all about Eve suddenly. And I'm like nine months pregnant and looking like a beach whale in, in my American uniform. And I'm looking at her labels thinking, where does she come from? And he actually thought, when I met her, I couldn't stand her. But... But it, it was a love story. By the end, I adored her. So when we went back, that was on the recce. When we went back and did the film, we had to pretend we didn't like each other. And then it went into... And then you had to make her act, because she was, she was div divinely beautiful. She wasn't acting in that. But she could but act. I thought, but you, I thought Ruby is making her act distant and making... Only because we had a chemistry between us. And when there's a chemistry, it's almost a love affair. They can't help but respond to you. Sometimes I, there the, I could do a certain amount of that. Uh, I could see the way pictures might add up, for example. I was out once uh, on the Pampas in Argentina with the gauchos, and they were all eating meat the way they do. 
you know, they throw the animal in the fire, they, they char the animal, they right. take it out, you know, they cut pieces of it with their cuchillo, the, the knife, right? And they, they stick the meat in the mouth and they cut upwards with the knife, right? And they do that. And we were getting shots of guys doing this. And I saw one guy with a piece of, of elastoplast over his nose. And I figured if we got a shot of him, Right? Yeah. Then when we cut it together, you'll see six guys doing that, and one guy with the elastoplast, and you get a laugh. Right? Yeah. That's that is in a, in a way is direction. And and you didn't do I, it. I, I did it. Yeah, I figured that yeah. out. We did it. Yeah. That yeah. time we did it. But I did it by saying, get me a steady shot of this guy, that guy, that guy, and that guy, and then get me a steady shot of him. Don't try and tie them together. We'll right. edit them together. Right. Now that's something you learn. You don't try and do it all in one panning shot. You learn. You start editing in your head. And I think that's part of the art, and that's something I did get a bit better at. But what always staggered me about you was you were getting pulling whole characters out of the air, yeah? whole a role, a person with a role attached would come out of nowhere and appear in this thing that you were creating. I was so so impressed by it. How can you stop doing it? You're going to do some more. Um, those films take too long, you know, and you know. That. Oh yeah. So now, how long do you? Do you I used to shoot for two, maybe three weeks, and post production for three months. For three months, yeah. Nobody can afford that anymore. I mean, because you are you are stitching together a movie. Um, am I going to work with real people again? Oh, I hope so. You know, then celebrity knock them off the the thing. The the show that I do now, and the show I did last year with uh, going into Appalachia to find the snake handlers, are many versions of that. You know, where I find these great uh, female wrestlers. You know, and we end up in the truck, and it's a scene from Some Like It Hot. And they eventually take me to their lap dancing terrain where they began their careers. I mean, those are still journeys. They're not maybe two-hour films, but, you know, they're still, I'm still in the heart of that. Or my trip to see Hugh Hefner last week. Ideally, it ends up funnier than you could write. Funnier than you could write. And stuff out of left field where suddenly somebody says something and you thought, thank you, God, for sending this one. It's always more fun than being with a celebrity where you're just hoping they show up. I've, I've been in scenes funnier than I could write. I've, I, I, had, I had a wig, a toupee, a, a hairpiece made for me in Los Angeles, and I could not have written the characters who, who, who spent their lives... Who made you the toupee. toupee. I think I, I saw that. That was brilliant. I met yeah. the guy who got an Oscar yeah. for working on the back of Tom Cruise's hair in Rain Man. Yeah. yeah. He did it the front, he did the back. Right. He got an Oscar for... for for the rear of hair arrangement. No, I met the guy who pulled the nose hair out of David Bowie. <laughs> so you, you can't write these characters, you've got to find them, and then you shape it, right? Yeah. They might say 20 things and you pick the one. And if you've really been at it for a while and doing it for a few years, you'll know when you're there which is the important bit. Yeah. And make sure that he does and, it the right And, and who's the lead? Like we, we just did Bollywood, you know, and they were duller than I think. But my makeup artist ends up, while he's putting on makeup, inadvertently just mentioning that he was busted in New York for smuggling drugs and he went to a jail in Alabama but the rednecks loved him because he would do uh, kind of voodoo ceremonies because, and then it turns out you know he comes from this royal family his mother was a princess and uh, all this is happening in Bombay right? Bombay, but it's the makeup artist so of course now the film becomes about the makeup artist screw the big movie star you are very boring guys yeah. really boring so of course the makeup artist is now taking me through the journey Look, I knew you'd been in Bombay and I was going to get to it but now, but now we're here because uh, I actually I thought Bollywood was very disappointing because the movies are disappointing the, the, the movies are, are like uh, Hong Kong kickboxer movies you can't believe that anything so bad attracts such a worldwide audience yeah I mean, and, and I don't believe that they're very inventive. You know, they're just, and they're wonderful people working in them. They're just terrible, terrible bitches. Well, I asked them, I said, do you have anybody like Woody Allen here? And they said, well, no, we don't have neurosis. You know, they just get up in the morning and then hope they're not dead by the end of the day. <laughs> you know, there is no angst. If you have no angst, there's no conflict. So what's the movie about? It's about face pulling and then the woman dances, you know, because otherwise the guy will get killed. And it hasn't changed in that many years with that irritating cat She's dying She's a princess music. in disguise and he's a bandit chief. Oh, but he's a really girl on the ship? Oh, I don't think there was a girl on the ship yes and then you talk to the big movie stars and they say it's all based on Shakespeare and you say take a hike get me the makeup artist that's an interesting character do you know so it's eliminating you know I didn't have to sit there doing naughties to you know some death definely boring so you people. were in Bombay and you a, a product you definitely a product of the affluent Western world in its most sophisticated form mm. And I don't know what it did to you, but I know what it did to me. It wiped me out. It was, I, was, I was weeks, months recovering. I had to write a novel to get over Bombay. How long were you there? I was only there for about two and a half weeks. It two days. Like two days. Out. Yeah. yeah. It seemed like eternity. You know, the first time I ever flew into Bombay, which is a long time ago, 
the plane was coming in. It, it, it's drifting the way the big Boeings do, you know, that beautiful feeling before it lands. And I was looking down into the grass beside the airstrip, and I realized there were people living in the grass. <laughs> yeah. a, guy, a guy with, a, with a, a bandage around his head got up and looked at the plane. I thought, oh, oh this is oh, different. Yeah. This like is new. <laughs> and then you see these barefoot guys refueling your plane, working on the engineering, you know. And it's a, it's a different world. Two days, huh? but that was... Two days, that was scary, it's But I remember uh, when I was going to Russia the first time, luckily nobody told me the track record with Aeroflot. Oh, yeah. Do you know, like 30,000 of them they yeah, can't really 50%. account for? Yeah. yeah. But I didn't know, and so I was eight months pregnant. The way, the way they burst into applause when the plane landed successfully, that didn't tip you off? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I love when the, when the plane took off, your seat had nothing that held it up, so suddenly I was having oral sex with the man behind me. I mean, there was nothing <laughs> that held... Straight, I was doing a back bend. And then the woman with the big ankles, you know, suddenly uh, disemboweling whatever your lunch was. Unbelievable. The smell you'll never forget. Aeroflot used to smell like kerosene. In my day, in 76, the first time I flew Aeroflot, all the planes smelled like kerosene inside, not outside. Not good. And the, the, the acrylic blankets had so much static electricity in it that when they threw one at you, <laughs> you as, would a, know. as a pass through this kerosene soaked air. <laughs> You, it was a kaboom scenario, right? Yeah. But they used not to arrive. It was it was it was kind of terrible. India is really, India is really more hopeful than that. And uh, I'm not saying that because there are a lot of Indians watching. They're great television watchers. I was stunned by Bombay. I was told by many people that Bombay is where it will all happen. That India will break through into the new technology. And the new technology is startling in India. Yeah, they, but half they, the world's computer programmers. Sure, there. but they're not there. They're in Silicon Valley. All ah, right. You know, they breed them and then they ditch them. I mean, they come, you know, by the hordes to Stanford, so. Well, I, I know you're a compassionate person, and if you're a compassionate person, you've got your work cut out in Bombay because you can't give your money to all the people who need it. Can you? Well, where do you start, you know? You, do you don't start, frankly. If, within seconds, you learn what the locals learn, which is that the, you're not even seeing the worst cases, so keep your money in your pocket. Or, or spend it on goods, and it'll trickle down to the economy. But you can't give it to beggars, you can't. For one thing, if you actually, you, you actually try to give money... No, happens. I didn't. It, it's just a thunderstorm. Because I'm that kind of girl. It's just a thunderstorm. No, I couldn't. You, I did. Couldn't and there was it. a there was a, a rugby scrum, and when I emerged from it, my, my watch was missing. <laughs> <laughs> More fool you. Somebody's and your now, teeth. <laughs> somebody's now wearing it. And your organs. And, organs are big. And I, I talked to a uh, a very very cultivated Indian about it, and he and he said, well, it's we live here, and that's that is what happens is you you do step over the people on the pavement. And, uh, and yet they're and the it, richest uh, people in the world are there too. And it's always been like that. Yeah, that's like they kept saying that. And I, I heard a lot about the trickle-down effect. But the trickle-down effect is mainly mud and dirt. And it's, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the worst thing I was told is that all the prosperity generates more poverty exponentially. For example, as the people in the country strip the country clean, they move into the cities... And the more prosperity is, the more people move into the cities. Yeah. And there's no end to it. And it's, it raises fundamental questions about existence. Like, you know, maybe the whole world will be like this. Maybe this is the way the world was. And, uh, and then you end up thinking how lucky I am and resolving never to go to India again. On the other hand, I was fascinated by it. And, it's, and, and, and since I'm in business to respond to the stimulus of the world, I wrote a book about it. So, uh, so buy the book. I have oh, the, so book. the book. I haven't read the book, but I got to make sure that you do. Ruby, what are you doing here? You're and a, where? You're a yank. You're a yank. Oh, I was a yank many moons ago. Yeah, so I was in Australia many moons ago, and I still am. Are you still a yank? No, I never was an American. I was always a stranger in a strange land. So I, I, I you know, it's just my way. But I think even in America, they always say, "What are you?" I don't, I never fit in, I never, I, I would have been unhappy there, and I got here and uh, was unhappy here, but at least um, the, the sense of irony and the sense of, um, you know, let's, let's like play with the darkness. Well, that's what makes you, isn't it? And it I think it turned you into a director. I think if I had to describe you, I'd say, director is a big word, and it's tossed around to some people who don't deserve it. But, and they were working in huge movies. You know, they make movies about a, a giant model ship sinking and they get called directors. I think they're just organizers, generals. But the, a director Morph is... Morph makers. <laughs> a director is someone who makes this creation happen, and, and you do. And 
you discovered it within yourself, and, and you do it here. So I think Britain should be. Well, they let me do it here. When I do it in America, they don't. They get frightened because they like it to be. You know, what what flavor can of soup is this? You know, they don't like. Um, the mixing of style, and that's my whole kick. So you know, the, I, I was brought up by America a few times, and they'd say, "Well, what is it? Is it comedy or is it documentary?" I said, "Sweetheart, that's the kick." So I have no place in my own country. I agree. I always liked it between the categories, and then yeah. somebody just invented something for us, and it's called WWW. Yeah. And, and and the world countries have disappeared, or they're going to. They'll always be there to provide differences and provide stimulus, but. Uh, the, the worries about distributing your work are over. They might only reach 50 people, but they could be anywhere and they'll be the right ones, don't you think? Yeah, but I'd still like to get my hands on the old movies. That's where the <laughs> real... Yeah, well, so would I. I'd like, yeah. I'd like to get my hands on Why don't on we them. raid the BBC? You know, we, we get I'll do some. That. Yeah, we get some Bader, old Bader Meinhofs and we go in there with our things. We, get a, we, get, a van, we get a van. We get a van. We get a van. Bella Clubbers. We go underground. You know, we get somebody from. I mind the truck. Yeah, you go we get in a there. distractor yeah. over there and then we run in and get the beta things or whatever yeah. those cans are. I know where they are. And you report to me. I'm in the van. You report to me on the little microphone. Do there. you think it's bad that we're saying this like there so that they're busting us? I remember when I was in university, there was, you know, we were all in the S. I wasn't in the SDS, but I had friends who weren't. These kids got caught. They were going to blow up a bank, but they were discussing it in a taxi cab because they were like rich kids. So the taxi just drove them straight to prison. Mistake. That makes, that reminds me of our conversation here. So when you see a guy with a black thing over his head at the BBC, it's you. Now, the BBC will never be smart enough to watch this transmission no. after we hit them. That's right? true. Yeah. Ruby, it's a, it's a terrific plan. I don't think we should say too much more about it. No. I think we should do it, get our hands on our own stuff, and then we'll, uh, then we'll uh, go into business. Then we'll be laughing. It's been a pleasure. More next time. Please. Yes, thank you. Ruby Rex. You'll be coming on my spot. When? As soon as I uh, grow my website, which will be soon. Let's have a drink. Okay, thank you.